On this episode of Gulf Coastal Connections, we're embarking on a tantalizing adventure through the rich culinary tapestry of New Orleans. Today's story delves deep into the soul of the city's gastronomic heritage, shining a spotlight on the legendary sandwich, Mufaletta. Join us as we unravel the layers of this delectable treat, tracing its origins back to the Italian immigrants who left an indelible mark on the city's gastronomic landscape. Beyond the dining aspect, we'll delve into the broader impact of the Italian community in New Orleans, from shaping the city's musical scene to contributing to civic leadership. The Italians have woven an intricate thread into the cultural tapestry of this vibrant city. Get ready for a flavorful journey that goes beyond taste. It's a celebration of history, community, and the enduring spirit of New Orleans. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. Hello, I'm Eddie Parker. The Mufaletta, that classic New Orleans sandwich, renowned for its harmony of flavors, comprises four key components that dance together on your taste buds. It's surprisingly easy to make at home if you can get the ingredients, which fortunately for me, I can right here at my friendly neighborhood Rouse's Market. Rouse's embarked on its journey as the city produce company, founded by the visionary J.P. Rouse in Thibodeau, Louisiana in 1923. J.P. Rouse, an Italian immigrant hailing from Sardinia, initially procured produce from Terrebonne and Lafouche parishes, then packed and shipped it all over the country for use in supermarkets as far away as Alaska, as well as operating a produce stall in the bustling French market in New Orleans. Fast forward to 1960, and the narrative takes an exciting turn when Anthony Rouse Sr. and his cousin Cyril DeMarco inaugurated a 7,000 square foot grocery store in Houma, Louisiana. The 1970s witnessed the passing of the torch to Anthony's son, Ryan Rouse, as Cyril gracefully exited the scene. As the decades unfolded, the Rouse's family expanded their grocery empire, weaving a tapestry of stores in various Louisiana communities. A pivotal moment occurred in 1995 when Rouse's stepped into Metri, solidifying its status as the largest independent grocer in Louisiana. Today, the saga of success continues to unfold with over 60 flourishing locations along the Gulf Coast, marking Rouse's markets as a formidable force in the grocery landscape. All right, back to the mufaletta. The first and foremost ingredient is the bread, a round loaf adorned with sesame seeds. The bread not only gives the sandwich its name, but also plays a pivotal role in its construction. The spongy interior of the bread acts as a perfect canvas, soaking up the rich oils and seasoning from the olive salad. Thinly sliced coconuts are the second element, with capicola ham, Genoa salami and mortadella delicately layered atop one another. This meticulous stacking technique not only creates a sandwich with height, but also ensures that each bite is a symphony of flavors. Now moving on to the cheese. Provolone takes the spotlight as the standard choice. This cheese is chosen for its malleability, contributing to the sandwich's structural integrity, holding diverse layers together. Last but certainly not least, the olive salad emerges as the flavor packed finale. Packed in oil, this chopped condiment boasts a melody of cauliflower, carrots, kalamata olives, red bell peppers, capers, and pepperoncinis delivering a kick of zest. The rough chop of the vegetables allows the peppery spices to infuse the sandwich with a delightful and zesty salinity completing the quartet of components that makes the Mufaletta a culinary masterpiece. Our story begins here at the American Italian Cultural Center, located at 537 South Peter Street, 
as crates of lemons traversed the ocean between Sicily and the Crescent City. They carried not only the fruits, but also the hopes and dreams of a community seeking new opportunities. The citrus trade routes, often overlooked in the historical narrative, served as the conduits for the original Sicilian settlers and paved the way for future waves of immigrants. These early participants, drawn from the urban elite of Sicilian society, laid the foundation for a prosperous Sicilian presence in New Orleans contributing to its cultural and economic landscape. Thus, the citrus trade stands as a testament to the resiliency and vision of these early immigrants, whose journey symbolized the pursuit of prosperity in a new land. Following the Civil War, Sicilian immigration to New Orleans became a defining chapter. The quest for better opportunities post-emancipation led many freedmen to seek alternatives to working in the fields, while Louisiana planters faced a labor shortage. Southern Italy's struggles and dreams of land ownership drove many Italians to view immigration as a chance for a better life in a new world. In 1866, the Louisiana Bureau of Immigration turned its focus to Sicily as a solution. Steamship companies effectively fueled the allure of opportunity leading to three monthly connections between New Orleans and Sicily by September of 1881, costing immigrants only $40 each for passage. This marked the start of the significant migration that shaped the Sicilian community in New Orleans, with nearly 300,000 arriving between the 1880s and the 1920s. These newcomers settled near the French market, creating an area that would come to be known as Little Palermo, or the Italian sector. This area thrived with small businesses, including Sicilian bread bakers selling the traditional muffaletta loaf. Street vendors echoing muffaletta caldo caldo contributed to the vibrant atmosphere, while wholesale distribution to grocers further enriched this community. Unfortunately, it wasn't always easy for the newly arrived Italian population. In the late 19th century, New Orleans faced a turbulent period marked by prejudice and discrimination, epitomized by Mayor Joseph A. Shakespeare's anti-Italian sentiments. In a letter, he portrayed Southern Italians and Sicilians as idle, vicious, and worthless, contributing to a divisive atmosphere. Shakespeare's bias, intertwined with political dynamics, raises questions about whether his anti-Italian stance was generally rooted in concerns or a strategic move in the face of political rivalry. The turning point came on October 15, 1890, when police chief David Hennessy was ambushed and fatally shot. Hennessy's cryptic last words implicated Italians. Public sentiment fueled by local newspapers targeted Italians for the murder escalating tensions in New Orleans. Following the police chief's murder, Mayor Shakespeare issued a directive that led to mass arrests of local Italians. 19 men faced charges, intensifying the atmosphere. The subsequent trial, starting on February 16, 1891, revealed weak evidence and pretrial improprieties. Jurors faced scrutiny and repercussions for acquittals, exposing the complex social-political landscape. Amidst the trial's fallout, a committee on safety convened, reflecting the volatile atmosphere. A mass gathering near the parish prison and inflammatory editorials heightened tensions. The lynching unfolded as part of a dark chapter in American history, orchestrated by an organized mob. Future leaders were implicated in the brutal acts demonstrating the pervasive prejudice against Italians. The aftermath revealed a grim reality. Lynchings were not uncommon in the United States, but the New Orleans incident spotlighted the brutality faced by Italians. Survivors were set free and charges dropped, yet the impact endured. The incident strained diplomatic relations with Italy prompting President Benjamin Harrison's actions to ease tension. The term mafia became embedded in American consciousness, perpetuating negative stereotypes to this day. While largely forgotten in the United States, the New Orleans lynchings remain etched in history, remembered in Italy. It influenced immigration policies, 
nativism, and the perception of Italian Americans, leaving a lasting imprint on the social political landscape of 19th century America. Our story now takes us here, to Central Grocery at 923 Decatur Street in the French Quarter. In 1906, Mr. Salvatore Lupo, the founder of this store, is credited with creating the very first Rufalata sandwich. Italian farmers and workers at the nearby French market were frequent customers at Central Grocery purchasing Rufalata bread, cold cuts, olives, and cheese. This inspired Mr. Lupo to assemble these ingredients in a convenient sandwich. Initially unnamed, the sandwich eventually adopted the bread's moniker. The Mufaletta trend spread with vendors like Frank De Nicola, known as the Mufaletta Man, selling sandwiches from street to street. This culinary creation, though embodying Italian spirit, does not have an equivalent in Italy, showcasing the unique fusion of Sicilian traditions in New Orleans. Central Grocery was badly damaged by Hurricane Ida in 2021 and is undergoing extensive repairs. They have resumed making their famous mufalettas and have them available to purchase at a local location. Craving a Central Grocery Mufaletta? You can pick one up at any of the following locations. Mufalettas are also available for nationwide delivery through their friends at Gold Belly. I'll leave a link in the description with all of this information. So what does the original mufaletta taste like? I picked up my mufaletta at Sydney's Wine Cellar, located next door to Central Grocery. These mufalettas sell out quickly in the day, so don't wait too long to get yours. Priced at $30 for a whole sandwich, they're worth every penny. Pre-packaged to maintain freshness, these mufalettas boast a standout feature, the bread. Baked fresh and of impeccable quality, it serves as the perfect vessel for the legendary combination of olive salad, deli meats, and cheeses. Swiss and provolone are expertly layered alongside generous portions of meat, ensuring a flavored pack experience. With its ample size, one mufaletta easily satisfies four hungry diners. Widely acclaimed as one of the best in the city, Central Grocery sets the standard for authenticity. Don't miss out. Make sure you stop by Sydney's and savor this delectable sandwich for yourself. How do you pronounce Mufaletta? Mufaletta, like so many other New Orleans terms, where the pronunciation has evolved from the phonetic term. While the owners of Central Grocery say mu fu la ta other locals call the sandwich a muff a lot a So, go with what you know. Our story of the Mufaletta takes us here to the Napoleon House, named after an Italian who made a name for himself in France. Now picture this, Corsica, once ruled by the Republic of Genoa, transforms itself into a self-proclaimed Italian-speaking republic in the year 1755. Now fast forward to 1769, France annexes the island, marking the birth of a man destined for greatness. Napoleon's lineage weaves a tale of Italian origins and family resilience, with his parents bravely resisting French rule, even as his mother carries the future emperor of France in her womb. Napoleon's father was a minor noble of the Bonaparte family from Tuscany, and his mother's family, the Ramalinos, held an equally important Genovese legacy. History unfolds with such twists. The French Quarter even has a direct link to Signore Napoleon de Bonaparte, since it was officially under his control from 1800 to 1803 when he sold it to the United States of America. And one place in New Orleans that can be directly linked to the man from Corsica is here at the Napoleon House. Well, sort of. Here's our story. The building in which we sit was established in 1797 as the residence of New Orleans Mayor Nicholas Gerard, who in 1821 extended an offer of refuge to our friend from Corsica. But the gesture was never fulfilled as Napoleon passed away on St. Helena earlier that same year. After that, this location transitioned through various commercial uses until the property found its identity in 1914 under the Impostata family ownership. 
Jay and Pastata, our Uncle Joe transformed it into the renowned Napoleon House restaurant, introducing classical music and opera to its ambiance. In 2015, Ralph Brennan took the helm, preserving the venue's antiquated charm and commitment to classical music. Napoleon House has made a direct contribution to the Mufaletta's rich history. Renowned for meticulous in-house preparation and a unique warming process, the Napoleon House Mufaletta offers a distinct culinary experience. In fact, the Napoleon House pioneered the idea of a warm Mufaletta, a tradition that continues to delight patrons in the heart of the French Quarter. The line to get into the Napoleon House often snakes down Charter Street. So if you find yourself solo or with a small group, ask to sit at the bar. Not only can you indulge in their amazing cocktails crafted by some of the city's finest bartenders, but you can also savor their delectable menu offerings right at the bar. Opting for bar seating can be a stroke of luck saving you precious time as you dive into the world-class experience awaiting inside the Napoleon House. The olive salad is crafted in-house, ensuring a fresh and vibrant flavor profile that's delightfully devoid of excess oiliness. Since Napoleon House heats their mufaladas, the cheese becomes irresistibly melty and the cocuts burst with flavor. Opting for the quarter sandwich is a lunchtime revelation, perfectly complemented by a side of Zapp's potato chips. Each bite of the mufalata is a symphony of taste sensations, a truly delicious sandwich experience that leaves you craving more. The next stop in our Grand Mufaletta tour is here at the Old Araby Food Store. Araby is a community located between New Orleans 9th Ward and Chalmette, and it was here that Elliot Gaspard's journey from a serviceman to a New Orleans grocer took shape. In 1953, after marrying Sybil DeSoto, he ventured into grocery store ownership, establishing a presence in New Orleans. The pivotal move to St. Bernard Parish in 1960 marked the beginning of a thriving business acquiring St. Maurice's Grocery in 1961 and Araby Food Store in 1973. Not content with just groceries, Elliot recognized the community's needs for hearty meals. The addition of a full-service kitchen serving poor boys and more quickly turned the store into a local hotspot, especially for a hard-working longshoremen. The historic 650 Friscoville Avenue building dating back to the early 1900s became a cornerstone in Old Araby. As the business flourished, Elliot's daughters and their husbands joined the family enterprise by the mid-1980s. Elliot and Sybil later embraced retirement in Diamond Head, Mississippi, leaving a legacy that continues to thrive. Elliot's passing in 2004 coincided with significant changes in the area, including the disappearance of gambling casinos and the revitalization of St. Bernard Parish post-Katrina. Amid the transformation, Araby Food Store remained a constant, symbolizing resilience. The store, affectionately dubbed the biggest little store in the parish, is a testament to the enduring charm of a community-centric business. At this establishment, ordering is a breeze at the front registers, followed by a seamless pickup in the back. The staff exudes warmth and professionalism, assuring a pleasant dining experience. As you navigate the space, you appreciate the pristine cleanliness and the visually captivating interior adorned with captivating works by local artists. This particular work was done by noted Araby artist Jason Landry. It's evident that attention to detail is paramount here, creating an atmosphere where patrons can truly unwind and enjoy the company of good folks while savoring delectable dishes. Prepare your taste buds for our culinary odyssey unlike any other with the old Araby food stores, Mufaletta. As you take your first bite, you're greeted with warmth from perfectly toasted bread, embracing a melty symphony of cheeses and cold cuts. 
The careful balance of flavors is expertly achieved with the heat enhancing the richness of the ingredients while a judicious amount of olive salad ensures the sandwich maintains its integrity without becoming overly oily. What truly elevates this mufaletta to greatness is the presence of chewy mozzarella cheese, adding another layer of indulgence to an already exceptional creation. It's evident that every element has been meticulously crafted, resulting in a mufaletta that transcends the ordinary and stands out as a true culinary masterpiece. The old Araby food store exudes a welcoming atmosphere that instantly makes every visitor feel at home. As you step inside, you'll find yourself surrounded by a mix of locals and soldiers from nearby Jackson Barracks, all coming together in the love of good food and community. The genuine warmth and hospitality of the people of Araby leave a lasting impression, leaving you eager to return for another memorable experience soon. Another location known for their skill at crafting our beloved sandwich is Di Martino's famous New Orleans Mufalettas. Here is their contribution to our story. The street vendors who peddled their sandwiches through Little Palermo may have faded away, but Di Martino's restaurant founder, Peter Di Martino, hailing from a family with deep roots in the city's French market, now carries on their legacy. In 1975, he opened Di Martino's, a restaurant with a menu highlighting hearty mufalettas and poor boy sandwiches. Di Martino's quickly became a success, and today, with three fast casual locations on the West Bank and a full service concept in Covington, it continues to honor generations of quality food and service. I indulged in their renowned mufaletta and a tantalizing cannoli placing my order with their attentive and courteous staff. True to their word, my meal was ready in a swift 15 minutes. While waiting, I admired their inviting bar, perfect for solo diners or those awaiting takeout. Now let's indulge in the culinary delight that is Di Martino's famous Mufaletta, a true masterpiece waiting to be unwrapped. As you unveil this culinary treasure, you'll be struck by its generous portions perfect for sharing over a leisurely lunch for two, or a hearty solo dinner. But what truly steals the spotlight is the olive salad, the undisputed rock star of this creation. A symphony of flavors and textures awaits as you bite into the rough cut olives, crisp carrots, vibrant bell peppers, and delicate cauliflower, all harmonizing to create a medley of taste sensations. The larger than usual pieces of these ingredients add a satisfying crunch, elevating each bite to new heights. Between the layers of cheese and cold cuts lies a world of flavors, carefully curated to deliver a homemade taste that speaks volumes of the quality ingredients used. Every bite is a journey through layers of savory goodness, each ingredient perfectly complementing the next. In every aspect, Di Martino's famous Mufaletta is a culinary triumph, a testament to the artistry and dedication of its creators. From its impressive size to its impeccable flavor profile, it's a gastronomic experience not to be missed. Treat yourself to this delightful masterpiece and prepare to be transported to a world of culinary bliss. Cannolis are beloved pastry with roots tracing back to Sicily during the Arab rule in the 10th to 11th centuries. These irresistible treats boast fried pastry dough shells filled with a luscious ricotta-based cream embodying the essence of Sicilian cuisine. Legend has it that concubines of Sicilian princes crafted these desserts to captivate their attention, infusing them with exotic flavors like candy fruits, pistachios, and cinnamon under Arab culinary influence. The name cannoli itself may derive from the Arabic word for tubes in homage to its distinctive shape. Di Martino's makes a very fine cannoli indeed. With hardworking staff, delectable fare, and a welcoming ambiance, 
DeMartino's is a must-visit destination for food enthusiasts in the Covington area. We have arrived at the final chapter in our enchanting tale. Last, but certainly not least, is the original Fiorella's Cafe. Our story begins in the year of 1964 amidst a bustling family grocery business known as Fiorella's Fine Foods. The store owner, Anthony Filarella, would rise before the break of dawn to go down to the French market to buy the freshest of produce for his customers, while his son, CJ, and his daughter-in-law, Carolyn, managed orders and stocked shelves back at the store. In 1977, tragedy struck with the sudden passing of Anthony Filarella, leading CJ to take up the responsibility of procuring produce. During CJ's routine coffee stop at the French market, fate intervened. The restaurant owner relinquished the place for health reasons, unexpectedly offering it to CJ. On May 3, 1985, Filarella's Cafe came to life. And after years near the French market, CJ sold the business in 1999. Fast forward to 2016 and a revival unfolded as the original Fiorella's Cafe on Franklin Avenue in Chantilly opened its doors. CJ's passing in 2023 left his sons Kelly and Kelsey to continue the Fiorella's family tradition of quality dining with friendly service. The original Fiorella's Cafe offers a delightful dining experience that combines efficiency with indulgence. Upon arrival, you'll find a seamless ordering process as you step up to the counter where you'll be promptly greeted by friendly staff. After placing the order, you'll be given a number and directed to your chosen table where you can relax and anticipate the culinary delights that are about to come. Now let's get right to the star of the show, the Mufaletta. Prepare yourself for a flavor explosion as the generous proportions of cold cuts nestled between slices of high quality, freshly baked bread are sure to leave you satisfied. The olive salad with its homemade taste and perfectly balanced flavors adds a delightful touch to each and every bite. And speaking of the bread, there's a good chance it was made in house given its unmistakable fresh taste and texture. Every element of Fiorella's Cafe's Mufaletta comes together in perfect harmony with flavors that complement each other flawlessly. By the time you finish your meal, you'll find yourself not just full, but contented with memories of a dining experience that exceeded expectations. The Italian community has gifted New Orleans with more than just an incredible sandwich. The Piazza d'Italia stands as a vibrant testimony to New Orleans' rich cultural tapestry and architectural innovation. Designed by the visionary Charles Moore and Perez Architects, this urban plaza, nestled behind the American-Italian Cultural Center, captivates visitors with its postmodern charm. Completed in 1978, it celebrates the enduring legacy of Italian immigrants in the city a tribute conceived by leaders of the Italian-American community. Moore's design ingeniously blends classical elements with modern materials, exemplified by the central fountain shaped like the Italian peninsula. Surrounded by colonnades, a clock tower, and a campanile, the plaza invites exploration and reflection. Inscribed in Latin, the fountain's message the Fountain of St. Joseph, the citizens of New Orleans have given this fountain to all the people as a gift, embodies the spirit of generosity and cultural pride that defines this iconic landmark. Located along the bustling Mississippi River in Wallenberg Park, the Monument to the Immigrant proudly stands as a poignant tribute to New Orleans' vibrant history and enduring spirit. Erected in March of 1995, this striking monument, crafted by the skilled hands of sculptor Franco Alessandrini, embodied the essence of the city as a melting pot of cultures. 
depicting an immigrant family on one side and a stylized ship front on the other, it serves as a powerful reminder of New Orleans' roots as both a port city and a haven for generations of newcomers. Alessandrini himself, an Italian immigrant who made Louisiana his home, particularly sculpted the monument to honor those who embarked on brave journeys in search of freedom and opportunity. Inspired by actual photographs of immigrants arriving in the city, Alison Drini's attention to detail ensures an authentic portrayal of their experiences. The inscription, etched with reverence, pays homage to the courageous men and women who left their homelands seeking a better life in a new country. With each passing day, the monument to the immigrant stands as a testament to the resilience and indomitable spirit of those who forged their own legacy in a city that is ever evolving and ever changing. From the pioneering spirit of Italian-born Henry de Tante exploring Louisiana in the 17th century, to the influential leadership of Italian-American mayors Robert Mastry and Victor Shiro, the Italian imprint on the city of New Orleans history is profound. Italian Americans didn't just lead in the area of politics and government, they also led in the business world. The soup sensation Progresso, with deep roots in the heart of New Orleans, began with Sicilian immigrant Giuseppe Udo, who started selling olives and cheese from a horse-drawn cart back in his homeland in Sicily. The elegant Hotel Monte Leone, established by a Sicilian shoemaker, stands as a French Quarter landmark, still operated by the same Monteleone family till today. In the realm of music, Nick LaRocca, maestro of the original Dixieland Jazz Band, is held by some to be the father of modern jazz. His groundbreaking 1917 recording of Livery Stable Blues set the stage for the jazz movement, leaving an indelible mark on musical history. Louis Prima, born in 1910, carved a dynamic musical journey rooted in New Orleans jazz, swing, and jump blues. His bold embrace of his Sicilian identity and his incorporation of Italian music into his repertoire reshaped the musical landscape, highlighting the power of cultural fusion. He is still one of my all-time favorite musicians. The veneration of St. Joseph in the city of New Orleans is another important cultural contribution made by the Italian community. St. Joseph is renowned for his pivotal role in Christianity as the husband of Mary and the earthly guardian of Jesus. Throughout history, he has been venerated as the patron saint of various groups, including workers, fathers, family, and expectant mothers. His influence extends to professions such as carpentry, and he is invoked by travelers, house hunters, and those seeking legal guidance. March holds special significance as the month dedicated to honoring St. Joseph's, culminating in the celebration of his feast day on March 19th, which has been observed since the 10th century in Western Christianity. His multifaceted patronage and enduring legacy continue to inspire devotion and reverence worldwide. The St. Joseph's Day Parade, founded in 1970, is a vibrant testament to Italian heritage in the heart of the city of New Orleans. With a mission to keep Italian traditions alive, the Society's annual parade through the French Quarter celebrates St. Joseph's Day with music, dance, and camaraderie. Step back in time with me and explore the rich history of the Bogard Keys Historic House and Garden. Originally acquired in 1865 by Genoa businessman Dominic Lanata as an investment, the house found itself in the hands of various tenants through the years. However, it wasn't until 1904 that the property found its long-term residence in the Ginocana family. Hailing from Sicily, the Ginocanas were established wine and liquor merchants, infusing the house with their own unique heritage and legacy. From the late 1890s, they likely graced its halls as tenants before officially calling it their own. Their tenure at the Burgard Keys House offers a captivating glimpse into the vibrant tapestry of New Orleans' past where cultures converge and stories intertwine. Now, let us experience the magic of St. Joseph's Day 
at the historic BK House and Gardens as we pay homage to this cherished Sicilian tradition. Since the late 19th century, Sicilian immigrants have brought the spirit of celebration to the French Quarter, infusing it with their rich cultural heritage. Each year, the BK House invites the public to join them in commemorating this sacred occasion with a stunning altar, a testament to the enduring legacy of faith and community. The tradition of St. Joseph Day altars, born from Sicily's historical struggles, found a new home in New Orleans with Sicilian immigrants. Families transformed living spaces into elaborate altars, and the tradition now involves around communal visits, prayers, charity, and the symbolic exchange of lucky beings. The St. Joseph's Day altar, originating from Sicily, embodies a rich tradition steeped in gratitude and reverence. The genesis lies in a poignant moment of desperation when the people beseech St. Joseph for relief from a devastating drought. Their prayers answered with rain, they express their thankfulness by crafting a table adorned with a plethora of harvested foods. This gesture, steeped in symbolism and tradition, continues to this day as a fulfillment of promises made and prayers answered. The altar, typically fashioned in the shape of a cross, pays homage to the Holy Trinity, with Saint Joseph prominently featured at its apex. Rich in symbolism, each element, from bread shaped as carpenter tools to hard boiled eggs symbolizing rebirth, carries profound significance. Notably absent is meat, an observant of the Lenten season, but abundant are reminders of survival, bounty, and divine providence. As visitors offer their written petitions and partake in the sacred display, they join in a timeless ritual of gratitude and faith. Collectively, these stories weave a tapestry of Italian influence that spans exploration, leadership, cuisine, music, and tradition, enriching the vibrant cultural mosaic of New Orleans. Thank you for joining us on this adventure, and we'd be delighted if you decided to join our community. Consider becoming a part of our journey by subscribing, giving us a thumbs up to share some love, and spreading the joy with your friends. Until our trails cross again, take care, stay safe, and we will see you again on the next episode of Gulf Coastal Connection.